Thank you all for being here with us. If I can start with you, Melat, it'd be really great just each of you take just a couple of minutes to share a few examples with the audiences of moments that have shaped your career as, 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 as women and as women in the media. And so I think by starting by, with storytelling, just hearing the experience of other people, you will see examples that resonate in your own lives and examples of frustrations that you might feel passionate about and might not have been aware of. Um, so please, Mela, just tell us a few, uh, within a few minutes, some of your own experiences. Thank you. Thank you for UNESCO. Thank you for Blue Nile and for everybody, the participant, to, for giving me this chance to talk about myself. So as a woman, um, my dad supports me. So I don't have any influence by men, mm -hmm. actually. Um, but uh, in my profession, there is some attitude, but I, I challenge it. How long have you been a filmmaker? Uh, around five years. Um, um, I graduated before one year ago. Before that, before I go to school, uh, I have uh, on three films experience as an actress, one as a lead, cast, uh, lead character, the second as supporter actress, and the third one, only one scene uh, acting and makeup artists. Uh, then the, the last one after I graduate, I, I work as an assistant director, uh, which, uh, which is on cinema now. Uh, now I'm, um, I'm writing my own script and I'm on rewriting stage, which is the most challenging because <laughs> I pick a big issue, which is really uh, useful for our community. As a woman, as African woman, I have, a, I have big ambition, big dream for my continent. You said you, you were first, um, you're an actress, yeah. a supporting actress, yeah. now you're an assistant director. Yeah. Why the change? I, I, should, I should exercise by acting. Also, I I'm, I'm, I'm really love acting also. I'm good at it also. <laughs> so I just, I just uh, experienced by acting. And I, I asked myself again and again, um, Melat, is it the right way to do my film this way? No. <laughs> the answer for myself is no. So I, I go to school and learn uh, some courses, photography. First, uh, before I go to Blue Nile, I go to Tom and Videography and uh, Photography uh, Institute. And I learn photography, videography, and editing and acting also. Then I don't satisfy. And I start writing and sitting home. Then I decided I, I, I don't have to write a script um, by experience or by my opinion. So I decided to go to Blue Nile. And it was not easy to get there, because they are uh, very professionals. Uh, so I get there. I had so much challenge in the school. Too much. The, the, the way that they are teaching is different and they're challenging me, and they provoke me to do a better job. So I'm here. Can we now. please give her a round of applause? <laughs> Amira, tell us a bit about yourself and your own experiences. Um, in terms of my own experience, I think I drew back from um, my own historical background. Um, not just um, from the general Ethiopian narrative, but my parents are from Harar. And Harar is a place where, you know, we don't really hear much about the history, but it, it was a place where five women saints um, run or uh, led um, this cultural um, um, family. So they were the inspiration. Um, there are a lot of stories around what these five women saints did in Harris. So growing up, my mother would always tell me stories from these five women saints. Um, and so I grew up understanding and believing that women are equal to men. So the question of um, why, um, why am I in the creative industry? Why not? Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm equal to what other men do. Um, but I don't have this bias of, oh, you know, a woman need to, you know, do it on their own. We need to partner with men. Um, we live together on this earth and our stories will be that much powerful if we do um, liaise and we work with men. So I remember I'm not, um, my educational background is not um, writing. Um, I don't come from that type of educational background. Um, I, actually my undergrad was in international relations and conflict management. Um, however, um, I remember flying out from Ethiopia to um, the US and um, on Ethiopian Airlines and that, this was years back, and that plane was uh, full of um, adopted children. And I remember not being able to sleep on the plane because the, the children were crying. And so I said, I have to do something about this. I mean, what is happening? Why is there this, why is there this big migration of, children being adopted and um, flown out to um, the US. Because, I mean, we, we come from um, a historical heritage where the community is responsible for uh, the children. So why are they leaving our country? So I, I remember writing my first article around this. And um, I actually submitted to, I won't say the name, but to a Western pub publisher. And the response I got from the editor was quite nasty. Um, but it didn't stop me from getting another publisher. I went to a publisher that I publish with quite frequently, and I love them. Um, they're, it's called Pambazuka News. I went to them, and immediately they published it, um, because they, they do publish Pan-African um, stories. Um, and so, to me, understanding that there is a platform for me, um, was, uh, you know, it was almost fire up my ass. I said, I have to keep doing this. And, and so, um, you know, it's, I, I don't think I've ever felt as a woman that I am incapable of doing things. Um, I don't think I come from uh, a historical background where, you know, a cultural background where I'm told I can't. Um, my um, mentor, is, um, I don't know if you know him, but Dr. Mutombo Mpanya um, from the DRC, um, a man, mentor. But I, I have women heroes like Amina Mama, an incredible woman. So there are people that we can look towards. Um, there, there are, um, you know, in, like bell hooks. Somebody mentioned bell hooks. Um, so, you know, th we do have women out there. We probably just need space to um, amplify our stories. Fantastic, thank you. Um, oh, there's, a there's one. There. Okay. Sagarana, please tell us your story and what your unique perspective is as a woman in media. Thank you. Uh, my apologies for missing the previous sessions. My, my closeness or my experience in media was not really a planned entry. I happen to be here and also close to the media and the filmmakers world because I was I am married with the filmmaker, Abraham Haile, who is a very supportive and encouraging and the best husband a woman can hope for. So <laughs> and that's why I really agree with Amira. Uh, when we talk about women and men it's not it's not a struggle, it's not a fight. It's a partnership helping each other to see the best in us and to kind of utilize, maximize, bring out the best in each other. So that's what happened to me. I'm lucky enough and I really wish and hope everyone I know and also everyone I don't know, every woman will have that opportunity. And I, I really hope my husband also feels the same about being with a woman who can bring out the, the best in him. I hope you do. <laughs> <laughs> it's the correct answer. <laughs> yeah. But being uh, close to, being in media in one way or another uh, is, is fantastic. It's a great opportunity to think beyond myself and to also kind of influence uh, decision makers, influence people who plan and make things to think in a different way, uh, to see women in a different way, uh, to show what an empowered woman can do. And you know, we don't always have to appear in front of the camera or at, at the center stage. I'm, by the way, grateful to sit here, Sasha. <laughs> but 
in every home, in every place, uh, in every kitchen, there is a woman influencing a decision, making things happen, and making a day of a man or a day of our children and, and a day of our sisters and brothers better. And my mom is one of those people. And my inspiration in life, in my professional work, is my mom, who was a wonderful woman, uh, a woman who struggled to be independent all her life and made sure that no matter what, under any circumstances, uh, I would strive to be independent and a woman of my own. And for a minute in my life, I never thought, or I, ha I, know, I have no doubt that women has less capacity than a man, because my, whatever my father did, uh, she could do even better. <laughs> <laughs> and in media, uh, when I, I'm so happy Melat spoke about her experience, and when you ask her why she chose to be uh, behind the camera, we were talking the other day about this, and she also specified in a recent experience where she didn't like the way women were narrated and featured in a film, and it's mainly because I'm not attacking men, but usually it's men behind the camera, and men who need uh, a proven case, a proven understanding of what a woman's potential is, what are her limits, what can she achieve, what can she accomplish in her life. So having us working for Blue Nile uh, Film and Television Academy and her working with Abraham to make sure women get opportunities and also to make sure there are many women behind the camera who can tell stories, who can, and I am seeing many of them here, who can tell stories, who can shape inf and influence ideas is, uh, has been a blessing, a great opportunity. So I'm grateful about that. Fantastic, thank you. I don't know if I'm right in saying so, but if The Guardian is anything to go by, um, the media, print media is in the West is very male-dominated. So, um, you know, what is it that you feel when you, what's the cloak you put on every time you walk in the doors of your office to help you feel you're able to achieve? Um, and how do you sort of, you know, thrive in that environment? Okay. <laughs> it's a heavy question. Um, the question is, the media landscape is male dominated, obviously. The tech landscape, technology, social media is male dominated. We know the numbers. The freelance landscape is male dominated. We know the numbers, right? Um, it is, I, I've been in certain situations at work where I am the only woman in the room. I'm the only person under the age of 30 in the room. And I'm the only, you know, African American person in the room. So I'm looking at a person, I'm young, I'm a person of color, and I'm a female. And there are times where I'll be in a space and I'll start saying something and I'll be completely cut off, right? Like I'll start speaking and a colleague as well-intentioned as they are because we work together and they support me and they respect me as an individual may not be used to speaking to someone on the same level as them and having a dialogue with someone on the same level as them. And so unintentionally they may look at me as if I'm younger or I may not have experiences or I can't come to the table with the level of you know, education. Um, but I realize that I have to be there. Right? My voice is necessary. And so when it happens, I have to take a deep breath. I take a step back. When they finish speaking, I will make my point. And then I'll say, as I was saying before you interrupted me, <laughs> which I do very often. Um, it's not easy, right? It's not easy at all. And there are days where I come home and I tell my husband, like, I, I just had a really tough day. And the reason why I have the emotion that I have sometimes is because I realize that dealing with that every single day, as well-intentioned as some of my colleagues may be, just wears on you. It just wears on you because you realize that if you're not there, your perspective and the perspective of being a young woman of color, that voice isn't going to be heard. So it's necessary that I'm sitting there. It's necessary that I'm in some of those conversations where if they want to know what a young woman of color thinks, I'm there to be the voice of that. Because the reality is, young women of color are the, the leaders of, and the dom people dominating on social media, on Twitter, right? On, on these social media platforms. We're leading those conversations. We're the ones driving those numbers. And so it's important for us to be 
at the decision-making table, when people are asking what women of color are thinking and saying, it's important. People need to deal with us now, right? And so when I look around the newsroom, I'm happy when I see women of color that are young and are being hired and I get to work with them. I'm not threatened by women who look like me. Like, you know, some people may say, oh, I want to be the only person of young women of color. I welcome and, I, and I'm always giving opportunities to my friends. If there's job opportunities, I'm letting them know because I understand the importance of diverse voices of diverse ages, of diverse perspectives, diverse backgrounds. Um, and it's a complete honor to be working in a major news organization like the New York Times. And the cloak that I put on are that of my ancestors who came before me because they did so much more work than I could ever do. Um, my grandmother says all the time, she came from Jamaica, she immigrated here, my family here, that the one thing that she wishes that she could have had was an education. She gave up her education to move my family to the States. My mother, her biggest disadvantage, she said, so she got her education in the States, was that she didn't know what she wanted to be, right? So she had this, this vision that my sister and I would at least be able to do work that we were passionate about, right? Give it up for all the mothers out there um, <laughs> who, <laughs> who inspire their children and inspire their daughters to be strong um, and their sons to be strong. Um, but she wanted us to live lives that we did things that we were comfortable with. So I was a child who liked to read and to write, so she encouraged me to be a journalist. And so as a woman, I feel comfortable being in spaces. I've never once questioned whether I was good enough to be in a space with a man. That's never even crossed my mind. Um, and that cloak comes from the people that came before me, so. Fantastic, thank you again. Helena, tell us about yourself, and obviously there's a slightly different perspective here because you're, you deal in still images, and we know if you look at billboards or magazines uh, across the world that you know the way uh, the lens is shown on women might not be the same way women might want to put it on, show, on themselves. So tell us about sort of your work and you know the, the intersection of photographer and female. Okay, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity. Um, it's a bit awkward to sit in front of the camera because I'm used to being, uh, and also in front of people, but I'll try to make a point. Um, I started photography three years ago. Um, uh, for me, it's a, you know, it's a way of um, being a voice uh, to people who don't have a voice. <clears throat> uh, it's also um, a big responsibility that, like, um, I have a big responsibility to tell it more constructively and like um, and also to be you know a voice to people who don't have a voice so um, I started photography like um, I didn't know what my talent was like until I started uh, I picked up my camera um, since then it has been like uh, an eye-opening experience because um, it gives you some sort of a power that you don't have and uh, I, I aim to use it for, you know, a meaningful purpose. Um, and my experience has been, um, uh, sorry, I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so as a woman, uh, having a camera, uh, one thing that I learned is people trust you, like for, for, for being a woman than a man. So I want to take advantage of that and tell a story of people, everyday people, who don't have a voice, and yeah. Can we please give her a round of applause? <laughs> Last but not least, Tamika. I can kind of break up my experience as a woman in media in three distinct parts in my mind. The first is my beginnings as a hip hop journalist, which is probably the biggest most lasting impact that had I, that in terms of what it had on me about how I needed to be able to speak up and to um, fight for the stories that I wanted to not only be covering the little Kims and the Foxy Browns but the Jay Z's and the Nas's, you know, to not be pushed to the sides and you know assume that I only had this one thing to offer and that's the woman's perspective to be able to bring my entire self to the table as opposed to just the, you know, being marginalized as a woman. Um, my first internship was really my first professional experience was um, interning at Vibe magazine, which was a big hip hop magazine back in the day. And uh, 
I had the experience of being on the receiving end of some sexual harassment by a superior, and the male superior. Um, as someone coming out of college, I really didn't know how to deal with that. And I was glad that I talked to a woman who I was working with, you know, about the dilemma and kind of like picked her brain as to how to handle it. And uh, she told me to tell him to deal with him directly, you know, and to basically state how I felt and, and, and uh, stand up for myself. And I'm really glad I did. It left, it, left, it, left a, it left a lasting impression in me about how I can use my own voice to defend myself and to create the space I want to create for myself in the industry. So basically, I told this man, if he ever said anything like that to me again, I was going to tell his boss and it was going to be a problem. And to this day, this man salutes me wherever he sees me because he knows <laughs> not to do that. Um, the second piece would be forming network. I was very blessed to work at Essence Magazine as my first full-time professional job. And if any of you know Essence Magazine, it's the preeminent um, publication for uh, black American women in the US. And I was colleagues with um, writers that I grew up reading. Um, even if they weren't what they say, in, as they say it, in-house, they were the Bell Hooks and the Dream Hamptons and the Asha Bendeles and other really powerful women writers who you know, used their, themselves and their voices to push the conversation forward um, about, about black women. And um, I'm really proud to say that some of those women are members of the storytellers group that I formed um, because I feel like steel sharpens steel um, in an industry where it's very easy to reach a limit or to feel like you've reached a limit in terms of how far you can go, to have a sisterhood around breaking through that ceiling, to me, is crucial. Um, it is to be able to hire people and to present them with opportunities to write, sometimes in places that they have never written or that they've aspired to write. Um, and then the third place, the third thing is um, being now in a position to educate. Um, I'm the mother of a son. So I have a vested interest in more men recognizing themselves as feminists. Um, because a lot of times the word feminism gets a bad rap. Um, but if you explain what feminism is, and it's really just that you believe in the empowerment of women um, and girls and the opportunities, the equality, um, a lot of them will raise their hand and say they agree. But the problem comes in when there's this bad connotation to it. Um, and so, I recently assigned or wrote a story for Ebony Magazine uh, with intention around highlighting the work of African American men that um, professionally and personally have basically devoted their lives to advocating for women um, in the spaces from domestic violence to sexual assault um, to pay equality um, so that more men who are our allies serve uh, as uh, role models for this kind of work for more men to do. Um, and so it's being shown how to stand for myself, then forming a network to support myself and other sisters, to finally being in a position to create content that will hopefully inspire um, more women and more men to, uh, to embrace this kind of work. As Sasha starts to speak, I would love you all to start thinking about questions and comments because everyone I've heard talk, everything makes so much sense to me. I'm like, why is this not obvious? Why are we even having this conversation, right? I can't, I don't know any men who are oppressing women. So we need to think about, you know, why are we still in 20, nearly 2016, having these conversations? And what, from your perspectives, in your own contexts, are some of the reasons why it is still necessary for us today to be talking about the empowerment of women in, in the media? Um, because there is a common pro challenge we have with being black or being, you know, and, and being African. So why if, is there even still a gender divide? And it, it would be great for, to have you, your contributions to that um, as part of the discussion. But Sasha, please tell us your own experiences of being a woman, of trying to champion other women and some of uh, the things you have learned and seen on, along the way. 
So before I respond to that, I would like to just acknowledge the people on this panel and through acknowledging them, indirectly respond to that question. Uh, first of all is uh, Melat and Helena, who are both students in the framework of the Pan-African Workshop for Professional Media Production. And I've been watching very closely the work that they've been producing, which is absolutely phenomenal. And I have absolutely no doubt that in very little time and probably in the tw next 24 hours, we will see their work on an international level because they are phenomenally talented. They are young women from Ethiopia that whose voices deserve and are being heard. And I would just like to salute them in that regard, uh, and both also for their perseverance and their courage. Uh, I'd also, and in responding to your first question as it concerns moments that are incredibly important, and Tamika, as always, has said a lot of the things that I would like to say, uh, I would also like to underline the importance of sisterhood in this regard, and in that uh, light, acknowledge Sigareda and Amira, who have played very essential roles for me as a woman and also as a media practitioner in the past two years I've been in Ethiopia, and although they are peers, I would also consider them to be inspirations and heroes, so I would like to acknowledge them. <laughs> and I would add to that also sisters, uh, the, question, sorry, <laughs> and then also more broadly Whitney and uh, Tomika and Eliza, but it returns back to your original question, which is these moments that change uh, the life of media practitioners. And me as a woman who's clearly not uh, of African descent, but I've spent uh, the majority of my life in Africa. I was raised by an African family. I have an African family, but I have different challenges because of my appearance and different opportunities, I would say also, which should be addressed at the table also because of my appearance. Uh, so in retrospect and in regards to your question, one of the things that I think is the most important, why I think it's important to acknowledge the people that are on this panel, is first of all, sisterhood. Secondly, mentorship, which is one of the reasons why it was so crucial in the framework of this Pan-African workshop to have both wet, m women and men trainers, because it's important to have models, to see yourself on stage, to see yourself in leadership positions, as Whitney was saying earlier, and to have people to ask questions as it concerns guidance. And here I would emphasize both women and men, because there are, the, the, for example, the He for She campaign, there are men champions of women. This is not a question of oppression, this is a question of the space that we can occupy. And in that regard, for women of, of a, an older age, let's say, I would also say the importance of having mentees. Uh, one of the things that I notice, which I think is um, uh, universal as it concerns women's struggle, in my career, the most difficult challenges that I've had are actually from older women. And so uh, one of the things that needs to be emphasized is that especially from older women who have gone through this feminist movement and who have gone through a period where they have had to fight in order to occupy just, to occupy just an inch of space is the necessity, as Tamika underlined, to form networks, to form a, in, even informal associations of mutual support where steel sharpens steel as Tamika said, where my success is her success and her success is mine. So this kind of community of openness and mutual support I think is incredibly crucial in order to facilitate uh, in the media field. One of the things that I'd like to underline, because Amira talked about this question of space and of amplifying stories. Um, Hillary Clinton, again, I saw it on Facebook recently, once uh, said, uh, you know, I'm not shouting, I'm just speaking up. Like, why is there, you know, when a woman opens her voice, why is it considered that uh, if I talk strongly, which I do, that I'm shouting, I'm not shouting, I'm occupying space and I'm speaking up. And it's comments that would never be made to a man. And so in reference to what you were saying as it concerns why are we having this conversation on women in the media, and here specifically African and diasporic African women in the media, I would argue that it's incredibly crucial. I do not feel oppressed by any man. I feel like I can take the space that I want in front of any man. But there is a serious problem in the media as it concerns production, as it concerns writing, as it concerns portrayal and content of women in the media. 
which Melat underlined uh, in the, her first introduction to this question. So this uh, necessity to occupy space and create networks and associations where women can occupy space together, I would say is incredibly relevant and even more relevant today because we are conscious of the necessity to be involved in all aspects of the production cycle of media and I would argue creative industries in this regard as well. Uh, in, in that regard, I'd just like to close in saying one of the things that UNESCO does in order to make sure that this uh, oversight is addressed, and Whitney said uh, in her presentation, you know, we know the numbers, who's running the social media, who's running Twitter, who's editing, which is an incredibly crucial aspect of the production cycle of writing. In order to address this kind of gap of women presence, UNESCO has started this program called Women Make the News, saying there needs to be more opportunities, more training, and more visibility for women in all aspects of the media cycle. And this is one of the things that we try and do on a regular basis in our capacity building and also in our work uh, more broadly is to promote that gender equality in the media field. Okay, so over to you for your thoughts, your reflections, your questions. Uh, while I do that, I'm just going to read to you a quote from uh, Rukaya uh, Kesanali. It was um, some research done by the African Media Initiative. Very recently pointed out that sexist attitudes and stereotypes remain one of the major impediments to achieving gender equality. And this wasn't research done by a historian, an academic, or, you know, it was someone who was coming at it from an African media perspective. And they were saying that the inclusion of women's voices is part will be part of the success of African media full stop. And so in looking at what the impediments were, found sexist attitudes and stereotypes remain. Do you agree? What are your experiences? What are your thoughts? Um, please do share them with us by raising your hands and asking any questions uh, of the panel uh, that you may have. Any, any early takers? Uh, I'm a Mabet, Mabet Masman. Um, I stopped teaching this year. I was a school teacher. I realized that I found out it was a hideout. Uh, I come from two different cultures. Uh, my mom is from Central Shawa and my father's from down south. My mother um, never stood up for, um, for herself. Uh, she raised seven of us. Uh, my dad is a dictator. He still is. Sorry to use the strong word, but he is. And why are we having this conversation after? <laughs> because it still exists. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you for your reflection. And it'd be really interesting to hear from the ladies on this panel, because social and cultural norms affect our lives in every society, how, you can, um, how we can use our roles in the media to challenge those norms, and what are examples, concrete for people to understand, of examples where the media reinforces those social norms. Um, you know, who would like to take that question, or do several people have reflections on that? So thinking about how the media can break norms and how it also reinforces them. Who would like to go first? Our country is mostly male dominated because of the traditions. And um, you know, the representation of women has been very much um, overshadowed by men's dominance and cultural um, thinking. Uh, so um, it's up to uh, women, but not only women, but also men to change this perspective. Um, it's, not, it's not an easy task, but you know, there's a long way ahead, ahead of us. Um, one thing I see as a photographer is um, there's a lot of stories to tell. Um, there's a lot of perceptions uh, and misconceptions we have to change, but at the same time, there's a very huge um, uh, mountain, I can say, in front of us, because uh, photography is not really understood as a profession and as a way of expressing ourselves. Uh, it, in fact, it's mostly considered as um, uh, trying to expose something negative. And of course, that came, uh, that came about from our past. As Ethiopians, you know, we are, we are used to being, our stories being told as negatively, as you know, being poor, being, um, having, always going through famine and all that. It takes time, um, but I think there should be platforms to encourage young photographers, especially women. Because women, you don't see you know, many photographers in this profession. And um, I think opportunities need to be given. And also, um, even the government uh, should encourage uh, young photographers instead of questioning them. Um, 
I will say that um, changing the narrative of the black woman is changing the narrative of Africa. So one has to go with the other. Um, and in that regards, we need more space um, to amplify the, the women's stories, but the positive ones, because as we know, um, the stories that we hear are very, um, you know, it's this object. We're, we're portrayed as this object of pity, um, victims, and we're not. Um, so we need spaces where the, the positive stories are told. Um, just recently, uh, we're doing the seven-part series. You mentioned something about land and women. We're doing the seven-part series um, stories um, in collaboration with One World, and it's actually talking about what women in Africa are doing about food sovereignty and land. Um, and women are fighting on this continent. It's just that we don't hear their stories. We don't hear what they're doing. So we just, I think we need more um, access. We need space that um, lifts and amplifies these stories because um, there are incredible, amazing, positive stories regarding women. I mean, I, I'm not saying a new thing if I say media has a very strong influence in shaping culture and all uh, the gender inequalities, uh, violence against women, all the abuses on women and uh, female children or even children in general, they are deep-rooted in our culture. They originate from somewhere where at some point people understood this is the right way to treat a woman. If a man is not strong enough to discipline his wife, he fell. And for the man, probably he's doing the right thing. So this was influenced at some point by some uh, uh, way of thinking and culture, and it still prevails. And now with the media, with the increased access to media and media products, it's, there is an opportunity to influence that culture. And that's where I think women media professionals play a role. And unless they are trained and unless they are equipped with the right skills to use media, film, photography, painting, whatever uh, sort of creative arts to advocate for women's issues, then that's, I think that would be the failure. So, but there is now an opportunity. There are more and more young women coming out, making their voice uh, being heard, and you know, coming up with interesting ideas on how to change uh, society. So trainings like this one, uh, which I really uh, appreciate, Sasha, for being behind it. Uh, okay, together with Blue Nile and <laughs> it's very important. So training, 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 and more training not only to see film as an entertainment or cinema as an entertainment platform and uh, profit generation instrument, but also as a means of a very powerful means of advocacy and uh, calling for positive social change. I think that it also really begins with personal development for women. It means doing critical thinking. You know, why is it that there is a lack of desire to see stories or to uh, allow women to be in positions of power. Where does that come from? <clears throat> Dissecting it. Is it fear-based? Is it fear of competition? Is it fear of you know, uh, losing control? When you start to pick apart some of the reasons and the rationales and some of the historical sort of context to why um, it is an easy thing to try and um, have a con an easier thing to try to have a conversation about race rather than patriarchy when you get people of color together and you start to challenge that. I think there's a way that you can build yourself up um, to kind of do the work, um, both personally as well as professionally um, in whatever realm you're in. Um, <laughs> I don't think I necessarily would have done the piece that I did with Ebony years ago. Um, because I didn't quite understand where the challenges lied. I was just, you know, seeing myself as one person as opposed to seeing it as being an institutional issue. Um, and seeing it now within this context, I feel like there's opportunities to create conversation that gets to the root and the heart of why these issues exist um, and, 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 and have that be a challenge to each other and to ourselves um, to, to stand up for ourselves and to not allow ourselves to, to not tell our stories. I, I have to give, it's funny, my dad was in the military um, and he inadvertently gave me a lot of skills to just say exactly how I feel at any time 
And I thank him for that. Um, I thank my brothers and my father for um, allowing me to just be. And finding those kind of support systems in addition helps to give you the courage to share your voice. It's really interesting from what Tamika said, make the point that everyone often talks about Malala as this great hero, and which she is, but every time I hear Malala mentioned, I always say, let's not forget her dad, because in that society, without a father who wants to educate his child, Malala would not have been going to school, she would not have been in the position she was in and faced the adversity she was faced. So as you know, Whitney gave a shout out to the moms, I want to give the sh a shout out to the dads also, because in a lot of those situations, they're the front line of standing up for, for the right kind of forward thinking choices. Um, so yeah. OK, please, can we have your question or comment? Yes, thank you again for giving me the chance to speak. I would like to stress the importance of visibility. For me, it's really empowering to see all of you um, on the stage um, telling your own stories, because um, um, it inspires me to go on and to become better and uh, achieve um, the life I, I dream of uh, having. Um, my first mistake was to study political science according to you know, society because as a female, I'm not, th that, that's not the perfect uh, subject to choose, especially coming from an Ethiopian um, uh, background. Um, opinionated women are not um, you know, really the ideal uh, I, you know, uh, that's a challenge for my mother says it's really hard because you won't be able to find a husband this way. So, I mean, this is a reality. Um, th this perception is real in my own, so, uh, in this society. Uh, not only did I study that, I used social media because I, that was a free platform I found to speak up um, and to share my, so that was another mistake. Um, not just according to my you know, mother, but according to society in general. So to see strong women using um, media tools um, is really empowering. I have a couple of comments. One is um, to go back to the comment you made about how um, we have to commend the fathers who do this. Um, I was raised by a Renaissance father, and my grandfather, uh, who sent my mom to school, she was the first Ethiopian at Addis Ababa University, first Ethiopian female. So, with um, so I, I and to go back to the the comment that you made about sisterhood, over here to my left is Kazu. Her her mom and my mom were friends. Her mom was the first Ethiopian woman journalist, radio journalist in Ethiopia. So. When we talk about how hard it is, can you imagine what it was like during their time when they're the only person in the entire institution, be it the university or at the radio station? So um, we have, to, I mean, we have to um, commend ourselves on the strides that we've made and that we couldn't have made it without our brothers. So my second point was to go back to what my brother here and uh, the power couples Gerada and uh, Abraham have done. Um, I don't know if you know, but they have a program at, the, at Blue Nile where they encourage uh, Ethiopian female filmmakers by giving them a discount. So that was something that, that I was very happy to see uh, come through there. So. Yes. While you have the microphone, can I just ask you, what yes. do you think your mother, or was it your grandmother? It's my mother. Your mom. Yes. And her mother would have said about what still needs to happen, because I'm sure they would have recognized all the progress that's oh, been made, but what I, would you think they I would see say? That, I see that daily. Um, I mean, I was lucky enough to, to, to have been uh, educated. I got an opportunity to go abroad. I did my you know, master's, came back. But I sit, I'm an I'm, uh, economist, I sit in the policy sphere a lot, even though I'm a big supporter of the arts. And um, I think Whitney said it earlier, in the IT field, in media, and this. On Wednesday, there was a quarterly meeting of all the IT companies in Ethiopia. There were 13 of us in the room, women, okay? It was a f you know, room dominated by men. I'm one of the founders of the Ethiopian Diaspora Association. We sit in meetings, inevitably, I'm the only female. So we still see it. But what I always say is, I think it was Maya Angela that used to say, if my parents, she goes, uh, if my ancestors could get through slavery, I can get through Yale. Mm. So, you know, it's that kind of feeling like 
if we're complaining, imagine what it was like when they started out. I'm one of the trainers, um, and um, <laughs> Dwayne, and I just like to acknowledge um, um, Shajira and Ibrahim for inviting uh, us to help as much as we can um, women's voices as filmmakers, as documentarians, photographers. I'd like to acknowledge um, my friend Hewitt sitting right here next to me, who three years ago, she was, uh, we mentored her through your program um, and Ibrahim's program, and her film uh, premiered at the Venice Film Festival and Toronto Film Festival, and I was able to mentor her for about a few months, making sure that her film, uh, her screenplay was as good as she could, it, could, it could be. And I think that this mentorship process, no matter if it's male or female, is passed down professionally. And I think this is a real good example because she is going to become a great filmmaker from Ethiopia, a world-class filmmaker one day. As I think about the diversity of this workshop, promoting women, support, the first thing that really comes to mind is really our mothers. How many of our mothers' dreams were just deferred because of family, marriage, you know, and raising us, being supportive to their husbands? So for me, this is just really an obligation to my ancestors, to my own family, and really to, to help support and also to, to encourage and show other men, you know what, that the value of our women being strong, you know what, expressing themselves is better for us as a unit. So we move as one and we move strong. I would like to believe that it's because we're having a panel on women and by women that people are just feeling women create safe space. <laughs> and I wonder if we'd be doing this if it was a panel about men. We'd probably go off to war at the end or something. But <laughs> uh, the women are able to create a nurturing environment where people share their stories. Um, so thank you all for your, for your honesty. Uh, there's a hand at the back, please. For me, what the women's movement and feminism has really allowed me to embrace myself as a two-spirit person, you know, and, um, and to step into that space and occupy that space. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion recently about the need for a balance, what women can provide, you know, that the earth, you know, in terms of patriarchy, you know, out of the earth is out of balance. And, and so how, you know, in thinking about, well, women leaders, you know, the need to have more women leaders. And I'm, I made a film with black photographers and you know, half of the 26 black photographers that we talked about in the film that we interviewed were women photographers. And, um, and so that's, for me, that's really important. And, you know, I take it very seriously. And it's not something that's like for me intellectual, but it's like, you know, I, I feel like I need, I need the balance, you know? And, you know, I don't necessarily, I don't live with a woman, you know, but I, I need to have women around me. I need that balance. And, and, um, and I need to feel that balance within myself. So I just wanted to say that. Okay, let's come back to the panel to reflect on anything, on any of the things that have been said. Some extra questions that I want to throw to you. One that was raised before about language, the fact that you know, uh, seeing a panel that was called, you know, something on the role of women or empowering women, might, the wording of that might put men off, and yet they might be men who are interested in this conversation. So how do we reframe the conversation so that men feel as able to participate in it? Um, and then also the role, how do we re-educate our boys? I think what we forget as we, I, I published an article from a, a Ghanaian academic who works with a lot of young men, and he said there's so much attention now on educating girls that we are not educating boys to be prepared for this new world where they have to compete with women. And so, I would love your views on how we make sure that we're taking boys along. And finally then, something I was thinking based on what Thomas was saying about how writers and, and creatives shape not just existing narratives, but can shape how we see the future. And I think Africans in general, we don't do enough sort of sci-fi, you know, future gazing. Uh, we don't make enough films. You know, we are so busy trying to rewrite the past or tell stories of our present. How can we use the media 
to start to create a future where actually children will have no problem imagining men and women as equal because they've seen it on their films and in their books and you know so their their reality might not reflect it but they might come to expect it because of exposure in the media and i think you answered the question um it's intentionally creating uh media materials that uh help bring the balance up it's writing you know it's writing storybooks from when kids are young you know that showcase empowered uh girls and women um, and showing them within the context of um, being equals and, and creating content um, you know, that also shows men and boys who speak up on behalf of women and girls. I think that's like a really critical piece. I think there's something to this conversation about it being a weakness for men and boys to advocate for girls and women, as opposed to uh, strength. You know, and, and much of the way that we, as women, have developed language to describe our emotions and describe you know, the things that we are going through, I feel like it's also an opportunity to model um, being able to have discussions that challenge uh, the way that we have maybe been brought up or, or, or taught through the media to think of women and girls. Um, you know, there's a couple of filmmakers and advocates in the States who are just doing incredible work, incredible work, black men who are doing incredible work um, to show their love and support of their little girls. And I just, I, I have been encouraging them to you know, form foundations or form partnerships, do more speaking, media speaking engagements where they have an opportunity to speak to boys. It's not a weakness to stand on behalf of your, uh, your girlfriend or your wife or your mom or your daughter. It's, it's, it's a strength. Um, and I feel like just by having that thread creatively through the materials that we produce, we begin to change the, uh, the narrative. Um, what I can say is, um, even though Ethiopia is, <clears throat> as, I've, as I have said, mostly male-dominated, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it's that way. I mean, it's changing. Um, there are men who are now coming uh, up front and supporting women, and that should be encouraged. Um, I feel like, um, you know, just as a woman, I'm not just going to say uh, I have been uh, suppressed. Uh, but I can say <clears throat> there are men. Uh, I have my father, for example, who supports me, my brother. So we should try to paint a balanced picture about the gender roles and also try to involve men. It's not, it's not only you know, women who should advocate about women. And it's not only, I mean, advocating about women is not, a, is not only about advocating women in a sense that men are also part of you know, the women's creation. Um, the, I mean, the other thing I could say is, um, you know, photography is, photography is also one medium of telling and telling and changing this um, gender divide uh, and trying to bring balance. Thank you. Wait, can, I, can I say one last thing? Oh, yes, you can. I'm looking forward to men being on this panel the next time we do it. Um, to close, we could have this discussion for another few hours, right? Because there's so many things that we didn't get to touch on um, in terms of the difficulties of being a woman in a competitive landscape and trying to um, pursue a career while also thinking about children, while also thinking about finding a partner um, and, ba and that balancing act. Um, being a woman of color and that balancing act in the States where um, the number of eligible men of color are limited because of the mass incarceration rate or whatever you may have. Um, these discussions are, <laughs> we can go for hours on this. Um, but for the matter of this discussion, um, you know, a lot of people talked about gender roles and um, equality. And um, as a woman and as a woman of color, I am proud to be a woman. Um, because I think that I add a diverse voice 
um, to conversations in the media landscape. I don't want to be uh, seen as a man. I don't want people to treat me like a man because I respect the role that I have as a woman. And I like being a woman. And I think it's special being a woman. Um, so, you know, and I respect every woman who either wants, chooses to not be domestic, have a domestic role, and chooses to um, instead pursue her career and not have a family. I respect that. I respect that individual. Um, and I also respect women who choose to stay at home and to write from home and to care for their children because I feel like every, every role is important and every type of woman is important and there's no woman that's more important than the other. I respect single mothers who choose to raise their children alone and pursue a career. I respect women who, um, you know, don't, don't want a career, like I said again, and want to just get allowance from their husbands because that's, that's the role that they choose. All these women are important, especially in the media landscape, and all of them should be supported by men, which they are being in this room. Thank you for the men who are here. Um, and uh, yeah, so we can continue this conversation again um, because there's so much to talk about, like right now in the newsroom and in corporate settings. Um, there are more black women hired at the Times and at a lot of these media organizations than black men. Why? How does that happen? That in the media landscape where men dominate, that you have more black women being employed than black men. That's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> Is it because we feel the minority check, women check, so we fill both roles, so it's easier to hire us because we, we fit two, two things, um, and so we should be hired. And so black men don't get hired by higher institutions, which is an issue, but um, what happens then? How do they take care of their families if they're not being employed? So that's another conversation that could be another hour. Um, so, you know, there's just all sorts of, there's so, this is such a complex topic. Um, and, you know, I applaud anybody who's brave enough to um, speak on it and um, to challenge it, as Tamika said. The only way that we can solve it is by asking questions first, like some of the questions that I just asked. You ask yourself why these things are happening. That's how we get solutions. Um, in conclusion, I think I would like to build on what the poetic expression of Aklilu, and though I could not repeat it, <laughs> it was so beautifully said, <laughs> but the other day I had a conversation with a friend on a lot of things, but one of it was, why is it that every extreme, extremist religious movement would like to make a point by starting to suppress women? And we said, and most probably it's because of this powerful role of women in creation and giving life. And I don't disregard that role. That's very important and it gives you, I am a mother of three children. Uh, it gives you a direct access to a certain uh, time of their life, a direct access to their life, to their, to their thinking, to their mentality and to their personality. And the other time my, my son came back from school saying, uh, very disappointed, he's five years old saying, uh, my friend told me men should not cook. Or, uh, and the other, also his other friend said, his mom works from home, so how come he, uh, his mother is going to work? You know, all these kind of discrepancies that later on lead to all sorts of inequalities, injustice, or unfairness, we call it today. We, we women have the opportunity to shape them in earlier life. And I think the society is uh, responsible for changing the past, but also kind of, uh, establishing a, a better future for our children. So this is where I think a woman and media women especially play a role. Uh, one of these roles is kind of making sure there are many, many uh, or more accessible products, balanced products, especially for children. There is better access for young women, young children, or, or I mean for young per people or adults. But looking for an entertainment movie or educational movie for my children, you always have to go through uh, all your products or all your products or whatever other mediums to find something to relate to. But uh, we don't relate to that to, to some extent. And you know, having uh, children material that are balanced, that can kind of show the way, form an opinion, is, is a good thing to have right now. And there, this is where women especially, but also men have a role in, in producing. And for your question, maybe we should call it uh, uh, facilitating, I mean, empowering, uh, how can men and women play a role in empowering women? I think that's very important. That's why, again, I would like to be saying and thank all the Blue Nile students 
who always you know, forget where you are from and acknowledge the school and empower the school uh, and give credit for the school for your achievements, for your accomplishments. I'm very grateful and that's a great energy for the school to continue. But I also would like to remind you, not only the girls, but also the boys, in making things better, not only for yourself, not for your financial means, but kind of shaping society, forming opinion, and making your work to say meaningful things that can influence others and that can uh, make a better future for all of us. Thank you. I think I'm going to echo what Whitney said. It's, um, I think it's a complex type of subject because when you create space for women voices and um, kind of orient yourself um, towards amplifying that woman voice, you wonder if you're silencing the, the men um, and feeding into that division, um, which is done purposely. Um, so, you know, it's, you need the space, um, and how do you create the space um, without alienating the, the men? And I think we do need space where women voices are lifted with, you know, in relationship with the men, in partnership with the men. Um, and also in regards to, you know, the, the Ghanaian story, I think it's necessary to also have educational material, create ed educational material that explains why things are how they are, like what happened? Um, how did we start constructing these cultural norms where women are against men or men are against women? You know, how did this start and why are we here? And I think that answering that question is, is very imperative. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to directly address in concluding two questions that in a comment that you uh, made, Eliza, one on the importance of future gazing, and then this broader question of gender equality and what that really means. Um, also to echo what Tamika said, I will future gaze and imagine that this panel workshop, uh, this panel that will happen, uh, God willingly, again uh, in the very near future next year, uh, will include men in a similar panel, and we will be back here and be talking about that mutual support. But I think that that's an incredibly crucial issue that you raised, uh, imagining in the sense of the, the imagination and imagining as in looking at the image. And this brings us back to the question of media and the screen. Uh, Sheikh Umar Sissoko has uh, talked and, and written, in fact, a lot about this question of uh, reducing African cinema to a factual documentary or informational documentary and the importance of putting forward the imagination and creativity as an avenue to liberation and to decolonizing the screen. And I think that that is something that is incredibly relevant also as it concerns uh, decolonizing stereotypes related to women and related to gender equality more broadly. And here, because gender equality also includes men, I would say uh, stereotypes of men and that this question of imagining what that kind of equality looks like is, as what Whitney said, which I thought was very key, a question of freedom. And that gender equality is linked to this question of freedom and also obviously a question of culture. One of my favorite uh, stories, and, and I'll close here, one of my favorite stories is it concerns the importance of, uh, let's say, information on the ground, but also informed uh, information from women and women's communities, is there was a journalist who wrote, who went, who traveled to a, actually a town in Mali and who saw that there was a, a problem because the women walked for two hours a day to the well to go get water to come back to the town. And this Western male journalist uh, went back and wrote an article about this issue that uh, it's so awful. These women, they are treated so poorly. They have to walk two hours. They must be so miserable. And then they have to walk two hours back and they are suffering. We must do something about it. And this journalist mobilized uh, the international community to fund the development of wells in the middle of the village in order to ensure that women could have easy access to water without consultation of the village and without consultation of the women. So this brings me back to a question of self-determined development, but also a question of women's voices, because when these wells were built in this village, the women went to the international community and said, what are you doing? This is the only time that we have to be out of the house and with each other. We like to walk the two hours to the river because 
we can tell our community and our husband that in fact it takes five hours to wash the laundry, but in fact we wash the laundry for around half an hour and the rest of the time we swim together, we talk, we hang out, we talk about our issues, our family, and we have time with each other. And then we go back to the village and we say, it's, everything's done, oh, the walk was long. And so this underlines for me, and I, and I love this story because it underlines so many different aspects of the importance of self-determined development, of the importance of uh, self-representation, and also the importance of women's voices in decision-making and in representation in media, but also in development at large. Thank so you. I'll close there. Talking about uh, gender issue um, in my personal life, uh, I don't have any influence by men. Um, my dad really supports me, my uncle, uh, my, my brothers, the boys around me, my cousins. Um, I had a lot of supports around. But uh, that means there is no gender issue. The, the, I mean, there is a lot of girls who have an ambition, who have a future, but who don't have a supporter. I know that, so I feel that as a woman. I observe that. But I have an experience once I try to organize March 8th project, which target to encourage women who have a talent but do not have a supporter. Uh, the long-term the long vision was establish a talent school, but the response was not good. Uh, almost uh, most of the company's owners was men. They reject my proposal because the, because of the bad, uh, the bad attitude that they, uh, they grow with and the ego. As a filmmaker, as a f uh, future, as a young woman, uh, as a strong African woman, I really want to do some creative and a positive narrative about gender issues. I really want to come out with this big issue. Because I know I'm, there is lots of uh, bad attitude about women. Uh, actually, I, I, I was working before, like uh, four months ago, as an assistant director. He, he assigned me as an assistant director. I, I really thank you for this chance. But I know all the crew that don't believe that uh, I assist. I'm professional. I go to school, I attend school, and I graduate, but I saw the, the, the ego. So I really want to change. Uh, thank you. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, it has been an emotional <laughs> and packed day. I want to thank um, Sasha and Abraham and all the sponsors and donors who are no longer here so we don't have to but at least we're doing it because we recognize that we wouldn't be here otherwise and it's a great opportunity to come together to share stories i want to thank this gentleman at the front who has been so skillfully handing around the mics we do not take that for granted thank you very much uh, i want to thank you all for staying the whole day but please do thank these women who have really poured out their hearts and their experiences and i really wish especially the students of uh, blue nile just all the success that they, they they don't lack confidence your students which is amazing you know and they're not apologizing for the things they want to go out and get and i think that the more young african men and women who just say yeah i'm good at this and i'm good to have to convince other people but i don't have to convince myself is a testament to the instruction that they receive um so thank you all for staying with us